That was a little challenging for me because, you know, he was talking about consumption and, and what, uh, what's important to us. And I think that's what it really comes down to is just changing our priorities, right? You know, America, we, we're, we're all about consumerism and capitalism and buying things and, and having the shoes. I mean, I like fashion as well, you know. But um, how much of the same thing do I really need? Yeah. You know, how much excess do we, do we live in, yeah. you know, in everything? Um, <clears throat> and I think the impact that we're having on the environment is there for sure and in some ways very negative. But I think more than anything, um, having a mentality of needing excess and needing more than what is necessary keeps us from, um, I think it just clutters our life, you know? Clutters our mind and keeps us from, from really focusing on things that are important like relationships and, and exercise and, 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 you know, um, so I hope that, that you know, as, as we're listening to to what's being talked about, that we're really analyzing our life and looking at things like, do I really need this next pair of shoes? Do I really need, you know, the latest and greatest in, in, in interior design or whatever your thing is? You know, it doesn't matter. But good, good, I think good, it's good. important to really, really be honest with yourself and go, yeah. Yeah. What are things I can start to shave off and really simplify my life um, and make room for, for what's really important? Is this hitting any of you guys? Or is this Very good. convicting? Very good. Is yeah, there anything in your life that you're realizing, man, I could probably not want that thing or I could probably shave off, um, you know, um, my desire for, for the latest and greatest, you know? I, I don't need the next pair of shoes all the time. I, I, what areas of my life can I be more conscientious with, with the environment, you know? Um, that's good stuff. I also loved the exercise with the food, you know? Being so mindful of, of where the food came from and the process that it went through to get to your hand, like right before you eat it, I think just makes you so much more aware and conscientious of, of what you what you take in your body, you know. If I look at a if I look at a flax seed and I think about what it took to get to that versus what it took a Dorito chip to get to my hand, it's a lot simpler, you know. It's like if I really think about the process that a Dorito chip goes through, I it, it just it sounds disgusting. <laughs> All the chemicals and the preservatives, it's, it's gross. Um, so that's, that's, that's excellent. I, I, I love that one. So we're going to move on. We have a, uh, a panel of experts in the world of health and wellness. Uh, do we want to bring them up now, Randall? Yeah. Yeah? Okay. You all know who you are. Why don't you all come on up and I'll introduce you. So we have Miss Janelle Blackman in the house. Yeah. I feel like we should have some music, like intro music for you, you know? Okay, we'll just go, we'll just go down, we'll just go down the line. Dr. Casey, Dr. Casey's coming. Vibrational medicine, which is, I have no idea what that is, to be honest. Well, we'll, we'll talk about it in a second. Let me, let, me, let me sweet talk you real quick for, for everybody. Uh, creative arts therapy as well, right? And medicinal or medical herbalism, which is not marijuana, right? A little bit, a little bit. <laughs> you got your, your, your undergraduate degree in fine arts at Monmouth, Monmouth University? Okay. Got you. And you have your master's in holistic health studies from the Georgian Court University. Very cool. Yeah, that's awesome. I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing what you what you have to say because holistic health is something I think uh, is becoming more and more prominent. Yeah. We also have Dr. Jenna Mateus. 
Metalus. Sorry. Metalus. Is, is Joe Bear in the house? Probably not. Your husband? He's no? here. He is? Okay. He's with child. <laughs> he is with child. You also have your doctorate uh, with an emphasis in health and clinical psychology, correct? And your master's in science and counseling and psychology with a focus on marriage and family, correct? Very cool. And Dr. Veronica Jones yeah. is an, ass <laughs> she is a, an assistant clinical professor correct, uh, at the Department of Surgery, uh -huh. and you earned your undergraduate with honors at Stanford University, very good, and Meharry Medical College in Nashville, correct, is where you got your, your, okay, very cool, and you, you currently are, right, you work at City of Hope, in general surgery, right, with, I do breast cancer, breast cancer surgery, very good. Very good. And Dr. Casey Blackman, <laughs> research analyst at the Los Angeles County Department of Public Health, Division of HIV and STD. Um, and you are also an adjunct professor at USC, correct? Very good. Well, ladies, I'd like to, for you guys to just give a brief background on, <laughs> on, on your particular fields, and we're going to talk about different things, um, and we'll open it up for discussion afterwards. Um, but Janelle, I'd like for you to talk about a little bit about what you do. Vibrational medicine involves modalities such as yoga, tai chi, um, qigong, acupuncture, um, really anything that kind of affects the way that energy moves, moves through the body, um, and it kind of encourages positive flow of energy within an individual, and it centers around unif unifying the mind, body, and spirit of every person. Um, creative arts therapy, my bachelor's is in fine arts, so I'm really passionate about using art as a healing mechanism, um, whether that be for individuals um, with um, advanced aging and dementia, cancer patients, um, soldiers with PTSD. Um, there's really a wide range of applications for art therapy. Um, that also includes sound therapy or music therapy. Um, I am a singer, so that's something that I do. Um, also, that is movement therapy, which includes dance. I was a dancer for 10 years, so that's also something that's really passionate um, to me, something I'm really passionate about. Um, so those are basically, and medical herbalism, to answer your question, um, I don't condone recreational use. I'm only for using um, herbs and uh, substances such as marijuana for medicinal uses only in terms of people suffering terminal illnesses, which would be glaucoma, um, cancer patients, anything like that. I'm 100% for that, but I don't condone. Okay, no. anything illegal, no. <laughs> so, thank yeah. you. Very good. Hi, everyone. So, as a psychologist, I focus more on looking at a person's experience and how they've used their experiences to understand and navigate the world and whether that has helped them or not helped them, to keep it pretty basic. Um, so basically, I'm a guide. I use myself as a guide to mediate that process for the person and wherever that might take them. There's a lot of different empirical research that supports different theories and when the person comes in, I decide based on what they brought forward, what type of research would support them. Hi, so I... I'm trained in general surgery, but I have additional training in breast cancer surgery. Um, all of the patients I treat are breast cancer patients, and I work at a cancer hospital. So all of my experience as of late is on um, people with cancer and how to get them to navigate the process and treat them and get them back to their families. 
So I've worked with a number of health behaviors and health conditions, but essentially um, identifying the resources or lack of resources or services that people may or may not have and how to um, link them up with those services and making sure that they are affordable and quality services for um, those people, especially for uh, vulnerable groups. That's, that's so interesting what, what, what you talked about the arts and dancing and movement. Um, how have you seen, can you talk a little bit more about that? How have you seen that to, to be a, an agent of overall health? Can you talk physiologically what do you think is happening? Um, I know for myself, being an artist, I think it's hard for us to release our emotions and art is a way to do that without judgment and without explanation. Um, it comes from a place that is very personal to a lot of people. And art just allows you to express yourself um, in a way that's very freeing and relaxing. You just kind of get into this zone and, you know, it's not about making something, art therapy isn't about making something that's um, beautiful. It's about expressing your emotions and releasing those emotions in a safe space in order to heal, um, you know, your mind and your body and your spirit. Um, so that's why I love art therapy because I think it can be applied to really any group of people to kind of foster um, wholeness and healing. Right. Can you talk about a, a specific person that maybe you've worked with personally that? Um, I did do some um, volunteer work with um, dementia patients and um, it's a difficult group because you kind of, you know, we all come into this world with, you know, all our faculties and everything together and to see someone at kind of the end of that spectrum, but to introduce art to them and see them kind of open up and really like flourish for a minute and just be like who they were again. And um, it's really amazing like phenomenon to see people, how all of us react to art. Um, we may not understand it. We, a lot of us aren't great artists, but it's something that we can all connect to, just that expression of something greater and something that comes from within is really just beautiful to witness. Mm -hmm. That's great. What, what, what's, how would you encourage someone um, who might be a little bit shy as far as movement and dance? And... Um, I would say that to dance, it sounds silly, just to dance like no one's watching. It's, it's not about technique. It's about releasing yourself, not having any inhibitions, and just going out there and dancing to, you know, to the own beat of your heart and just feeling the sound and feeling the rhythm and just connecting to it. And it's not about anybody else. It's not about anybody watching you. It's for you, and it's for you to deepen your connection. That's it. That's good. I love it. Thank you. Thank you. If, if any of you want to interject or, or share thoughts on what... There's a reason why people paint the walls a certain color, because it emotionally, physically, and behaviorally affects you. There's a reason why there's so much research now about how sitting on the 405 for one or two hours impacts your body, on a, you know, stress-wise, and why there's so much research about stress right now. Um, you know, when you listen to a certain type of music, how your brain keys, oh, this is relaxing, I like this. And that's about being really mindful and being conscious and aware of uh, your body. And that has a lot to do with dance, and it's, it's all really intercorrelated. So. Is that something that you incorporate in your practice when you're counseling? Kids, counseling family. kids, my life. Um, my husband said, "Don't share this." I'm sure to agree. When I'm sitting in traffic and I just, you know, it can be stressful. You know, when you touch, it releases oxytocin. So I just put my hand over my heart, and it relaxes me. And it may sound silly, but if you look at, at the science behind it, I'm actually helping myself. So. What is oxytocin? Um, it's a chemical that's released from your body naturally and touch is something that influences that. What, is it, what does it do? Mm, it makes you feel good. Okay. <laughs> it's a happy, it's a happy chemical that comes out. Okay. Yeah. Veronica, I'd like to talk about, real quick, aluminum cookware. 
I think is um, they, they're saying that it's a risk for, for breast cancer. Is that is that true? So <laughs> when you cook your food um, in pots and pans, some of the metals that are in the pots and pans can make it into your food. The best thing to do about that is um, just make sure your cookware doesn't have a lot of scratches or dents in it. Um, so just inspect your cookware. There are some studies, honestly, there are some studies that say that aluminum from the cookware does get into your food and that that can be harmful. There are other studies that say that the amounts that get into your food are negligible. Um, I say just be wise about your cookware and make sure that it's in good condition. Um, you know, and just, and that's with everything. In terms of it causing breast cancer, there are lots of things that contribute to breast cancer and not one thing that can be pinned as, oh, this is what caused breast cancer. And just really quickly, I have a lot of patients who come to me with a lot of fear and a lot of regret and thinking that if they could have changed this one thing in their life, they could have prevented cancer. And so I caution everybody to try you know, from focusing on one thing that maybe can cause you anxiety or fear or regret as the cause of this negative thing in your life. Um, I know the theme here is just being mindful and being aware. Um, I think that's the best thing you can do to try to prevent breast cancer in all of your life. Be, be mindful about what you're eating, how you're moving, what you're putting in your body, what you're believing. And um, that's your best prevention. I wouldn't pick one thing and say, oh, if I eliminate this, I'm good. Um, Really, it's about how you live your life. So. What do you think are some strategies that people can, can implement to be more mindful, preserving their environment, and whatnot? And that, that question can be for everybody, if you want to share. Yeah, I mean, just, just like Randall said, I'm like what you shared also about the Dorito chip. I mean, that, that's a, <laughs> it's a lot of pressure, though, honestly. I don't want you guys to feel overwhelmed leaving here. I mean, they're not going to, but, you know, just make small changes, like Randall was saying, small changes where you're just more aware of how what you're taking in is affecting your body. Um, make the wisest choices that you can, given your circumstances. And that, you know, this is about living in your means, with your resources, um, and so with whatever you have, just be as wise as you can with what you're given. Uh, be a good steward of, of the things around you. And so um, I think that's the best thing you can do to just live a healthy lifestyle. And really, I can't stress enough to not live in fear. Um, that's, that can do a lot of damage to your system. And it's not good for you at all. So um, just to not, don't make your choices based out of fear. Like, oh, this could hurt me. Just do what's the most life-giving and <coughs> pursue that. Excellent. I think one thing that Casey and Randall do a good job is, is kind of backing up what she just said, is it's not fear-based, is that they, yeah. you know, there's a lot of information that says if you tell someone the negative effects, it's not going to influence them. Right. People still smoke, we know it causes cancer. So, um, you know, it's based off of, a, I think behavior and motivation is really influenced by the person's perception of how that behavior is going to benefit them. So if you can find what value they have in that behavior change. So for example, the other day I asked Casey for uh, a supplement for a dairy product because I'm allergic to milk and she gave me this, what was it? Tofu, it was tofu. And you know, it wasn't that they you know, pounded these behavioral changes into me or whatever, they did it in their own life, they're doing stuff like this, so they're modeling it for me. And then indirectly, I was influenced by that. So I definitely promote, you know, being that model. If you want to see behavior change in other people, being that model. And um, if you want to help other people, help them figure out what they value. So if you're working with kids 
you know, sometimes intrinsically they don't have it yet what you have, so find the extrinsic motivator that they have. You know, if you tell them, hey, I just made 20 bucks recycling, I think a kid would be more likely to recycle, so. <laughs> And on another related note, um, so to kind of broaden like the clothes and what we eat, so even in gift giving, um, I can see that a lot of people love to give, um, whether it's for birthdays, for holidays. And so thinking through the packaging I'm using, am I having it shipped from, you know, all the way across the country, even though it's just my family member that lives in the city where I live in? So maybe looking at a local store that sells uh, something, can I pick it up? Or maybe the shipping costs, the shipping costs and the transportation that um, it would take with the emissions and that type of stuff would be much less because they're going to be driving a car there versus flying it. So thinking through some of those things, or maybe even DIY gifts. So kind of shifting gears, but yeah. making sure that. You know, like whatever, if you don't want to do it in eating or you want to do it in a certain area, you know, picking whatever area you feel comfortable in, changing and like, okay, I know so-and-so's birthday is coming up or Mother's Day is coming up and um, I want to give my mom something or maybe I'll make her a favorite meal instead of buying her something. And she's like, I don't need 10, you know, whatever you keep buying her. She has collectibles or something, so... You know, just just looking at different ways that you can bring mindfulness into other areas um, in your life. Yeah that's, yeah, that's great. I love that. Because um, it's oh yeah, go ahead. <clears throat> Could we circle back around to the cancer thing again? I wanted to ask Ron. If yeah, that's fine. Say, um, is is the rate of incidence in uh, first world nations like U.S., Canada? Is, is the rate of incidence of, can of cancer not just breast cancer but cancer? Does is it going up? Is there data to support that? Yeah, there's data to support that the incidence is going up. Part of it, um, just a small part of it, is what we call lead time bias. So, I know that's a big fancy term, but <laughs> all it means is that our detection methods are getting much better. Right. And so we're catching a lot more cancers that originally were just being, you know, were not being caught. Mm -hmm. And um, we're, like, keeping records of data a lot better now. So before you'd be like, oh yeah, my great grandmother passed away. I don't know what she died from. You know, now it's like, okay, this person has this diagnosis. So so, so align, in line with that, what are, I mean, obviously we talk about the whole environment, but obviously what we ingest and what we breathe in is not to be, and what we wear, maybe even what we wear, but um, what are some, like the big, between four, what are like the big three or four things that <laughs> we could avoid uh, that would probably cause the rate of uh, the incidence of cancer to go down substantially. I mean, there's like different foods. I mean, again, stuff that's scientifically proven. Not, yeah. and, I, and I get the thing with aluminum, I've heard that too, but just in general. Yeah, in general, um, I, I don't know if this was said earlier, but, and maybe you guys have heard this before, but sugar. <laughs> Yeah. Sugar's not good for you. Yeah. Um, I know, I'm sad, right? I love sugar, but um, <laughs> sugar's not good for you. It's not good for you in anything. Um, and I'm talking about the process, like white sugar that you buy in the package, um, trying to shift to. Uh, sugar, yes, yes. Can you say it louder because we can't hear you. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I was just saying, like, any type, like, if you want to shift the brown sugar, honey, like, it's still how your body metabolizes it is the same way. So it may be a healthier version, but sometimes people like to go hard on it, like, oh, I'm having a Diet Coke instead of a regular Coke. So I'm going to have four Diet Cokes when I, and not thinking good, through good, good, good these um, alternative sugars and what they're going to do to your body. So good. Yeah, and there's a lot of pollution. So I know that um, Randall talked about that earlier, but and, it's a big one. And then also um, thinking through on a larger scale how we were talking about that we're all connected. If you think about, and you hardly hear about what happens to farm workers, but because I'm from Bakersfield and Kern County where we get pretty much all of America's produce and the other Central Valley, there's a lot of pesticide sprays and these farm workers are just in horrible working conditions. So thinking through 
when I'm buying this cheaper apple that's been heavily sprayed, it's not just for myself, I'm gonna wash it off and it'll be okay, but think about the, the farm worker that was there and had to be ingesting all of that as it's being sprayed and just different things like that. So trying to stay away from, uh, some of you may have heard of the Dirty Dozen, like apples, strawberries, uh, trying to buy those at a farmer's market where it's local, um, and if it's organic, you know, you can do that. And, you know, maybe something that you peel, like an orange or banana, you know, if that's what you want to partake in, that's okay. But at least um, you don't have to worry about so much about the pesticide use and that going to your body. So, uh, but you know, you have to pick and choose and see what um, works in your price range and what you're okay with. And be okay, be okay with whatever you can live with and be forgiving of yourself. Like, it's okay if you cannot buy everything organic and, you know, top shelf. So, Decide what works for yourself. So if, so if we, um, so if I'm walking into a grocery store, right, and I'm buying my food, um, and I can't necessarily afford organic, what are some things that I should be looking for? Like what's, what's, because you mentioned sugar. So are you saying cut out sugar altogether? Or are there particular types of sugar that we could get? I, I like your sweets. So, so you know what I'm saying? I'm not saying to cut sugar out completely. That's going to be tough. Okay. Um, I just think that, okay, this, this may be a really long answer. I'm so sorry. No, that's, that's I'm so sorry. Um, but <clears throat> just one, I would say look at why you're eating it. So your motivation for eating sugar. A lot of people eat sweets out of emotion or circumstance or so just <coughs> and look at that. Tired. Yeah, there's a lot of things that influence why you're picking something sugary to eat. So that's the first thing that I would should, and that goes back to mindful eating like, okay, just take a step back and say, okay, why am I eating this? And it, I'm not saying, you know, sugar is the enemy. That's not what I'm saying. But it's not good for you, and, and a lot of times if you evaluate why you're reaching for that sugary snack, you uncover something a little bit deeper that maybe you can address. Mm. Um, in general, you want to get your sugar from whole sources, so like fruits and sweet vegetables right. and um, stuff that's not been processed as much. Yeah, go ahead. I will take So microwaving is not a natural thing. Um, I would say in terms of food, I mean, let's say you're cooking it right, and then the next day you're cooking it again, but not in a natural way. So whatever nutrients were lost in the cooking process, I mean, you know, so you kind of have to wait. Then I understand like, you know, we all go to work and we have to heat up our food, like we don't have a hot plate, we can't, we have to kind of just deal with it and say, okay, well, I'm gonna warm up my food today, but maybe tomorrow, like I'll bring a salad, bring something cold. And I've been trying to implement reheating my food on the stove and it's so hard because then you have to say, okay, I'm gonna eat at like 1.30, I warm up my food at like one. <laughs> like you have to figure out <laughs> like how it's gonna work. And yes, it takes a lot more time, but in the long run, I think it's better for you to try to at least, you know, one or two days, try to limit like the microwaving. And like Veronica said, like it's very hard to measure the effect and how much radiation it's giving off. But like we can only do our best and try not to, you know, put too much focus on that. Yeah. Yeah, I think microwaving also has a lot to do with your style of life. So if every day you're microwaving your food, think back, what type of life are you leading? And no judgment, you know, that's the worst thing you can do is judge yourself. It's more like, what changes can I make to improve my style of life? Sugar is sugar, and it all has yeah. the same effect on your body. Um, in terms of stevia, that's a little bit different because it's not technically considered sugar. It does have a sweet taste, um, but it's primarily from a plant. Um, if you're looking to try that, it's a good alternative to kind of like wean you off of sugar. Um, <laughs> but when you're looking for it, just make sure that it only contains stevia because it could contain um, sugar alcohols, which are not so great, like xylitol and stuff like that. Um, 
But like my philosophy is kind of like everything in moderation. I'm not for depriving myself. If I want something, <laughs> I mean, come on. If I want something sweet one day, I'm gonna have it, and that's it. Yeah, yeah. And just make a commitment to that. Mm -hmm. Do you have a question? <laughs> I was just going to piggyback on that. If, if you want to be more mindful, you could practice stimulus control, which is if you eat more in the kitchen, you know, avoid, choose where you're going to eat. So figuring out where you eat these foods the most and controlling the stimulus. Oh, something else to add. Um, that's good that you talked about location or even there's studies that show that um, when women eat uh, around men, they tend to eat more, or just thinking about, do I eat more around certain family members or certain friends, and how maybe I can be more mindful when I'm around them, not to, I'm not saying to avoid them, but just be thinking <laughs> through like, man, like, we're just in conversation, and I'm just, you know, chowing down and thinking through like, oh, I wasn't even really hungry when I came, but I sense we met at this coffee shop. I think I'll get more than coffee. I'll just, you know, eat yeah. this and that. So, thinking through that. Especially with women, I think a lot about cleansers and, and just all these things. And you're seeing so many ingredients so that are tons and tons of the same in this. You know, so, so I'm um, I become really mindful of that. Um, I try to use products that don't have a lot of ingredients don't have a lot of additives that are organic because yes, we're not ingesting it, but it's still going into our skin, which is open. It's going to our bloodstream. Like we're still getting that substance in our body. Um, so I think it's important to just be mindful of what you're putting in, ingesting on your skin, in your hair, anything. Cleaning products. Yeah, cleaning products ex especially yeah. are um, so what in, what ingredients should you look out for as far as the, those um, types of products? Or which ones should you avoid? avoid? Which ones should, should you avoid? Um, bleach. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Bleach is pretty bad. Um, she said bleach. Yeah. yeah. Anything that's a chemical. Um, like there's a lot of natural uh, cleaners out there. Like Seventh Generation is a good brand. Um, you can even use stuff in your cabinet like vinegar. Lemon juice, like you don't need to use chemicals um, to clean your house. And these things are safe. They're not gonna, you know, spray toxins into the air. Um, also, air fresheners are really toxic. Um, there's a lot of things that you can find. You can use essential oils. Um, there's a lot of great substitutes for. I mean, these things that we're all accustomed to using everyday life. That's good. I think having a kid has influenced me, so now I think, would I put that on my son? You know, he's 18 months old, and if they say it's not good for a baby, you know. We kind of talked about it. What about pollution? And so, you know, I can't, I'm choosing not to leave LA, but we're around pollution. So what can I really do about that? <coughs> Eat vegetables, drink water, buy a filter. Yeah, so that's kind of complicated, um, and it, a lot of times it depends on where in LA you're living. For example, if you live, so, you know, <laughs> with city developers and public health people, there's a lot of um, back and forth or like politicizing of stuff. So there's not supposed to be houses advised within 500 feet of the freeways, but we clearly see there's high rises up and down the 110, 101, all of that. And so um, some things for those people that live right there um, to, um, they have to consistently like clean um, to dust more frequently, close their window, because um, noise pollution is also a bad thing. It affects your sleep. We didn't talk much about sleep, but sleep also, or the um, poor quality of sleep also affects your health behavior and health outcomes. Um, so thinking through that, um, you know, if you can buy locally grown things, that also cuts down on pollution. Looking at um, the air quality of the day, is it going to be, um, is there, are they saying it's a poor day, so maybe I'll do more activities inside instead of taking a walk outside, even though we do need vitamin D, but just thinking through kind of what kind of day is it, or if you want to go to the beach and get in the water and they're saying that um, there's a lot of pollutants in the water, maybe go into um, 
another body of water that might be cleaner, um, like a river or whatever the case is, or so try to just change it up or to look more on, um, there's the California Environmental uh, Protection Agency. Also, LA County has some websites, so you can kind of look more into, I like these activities or I'm interested in such and such, and should I do this today or not? I don't know if that kind of yeah, answers helps. your question. So be more conscious of how the air quality is. Mm -hmm. Or even like the soil, for example. I don't know if you all heard, um, the plant has been polluting southeast LA since 1922 when they opened. They just permanently closed in 2015. Mm -hmm. So these people in their soil, it's just horrible lead and um, and so they've been getting compensated for that, but they've had to dig um, huge uh, feet of um, removing that soil so that people can even tend to it. Because you know we have these recommendations like, oh, you know, start your own home garden or that type of stuff. But that's if your soil's not good, then that's going to be. And a lot of these people had asthma and different uh, respiratory issues. So, um, but another option that they could do is raise beds. But again, there's a lot of emissions that are also coming like arsenic onto their soil and that type of stuff. So um, I guess, you know, just thinking through what do I, what pollutants are closer to my household and being able to make those adjustments accordingly. Any other questions? Go ahead. Uh, my daughter is 20 months and she's currently on breast milk that I buy. I do want to, I'm thinking around two to stop the breast milk. What milk can I purchase? Because I was thinking Vitamix and I'll get some nuts and I'm like, what's, am I really going to keep that up? Is there something I can go to the store and buy that? You want to be non-dairy? Non-dairy, yes. Okay. I'm, I'm biased, so. I'm yes, that's, bias, what, that's really. what I prefer. Right. Uh, so um, we tried a Rima on, um, it wasn't flax milk, ripple milk. Ripple milk is made out of pea protein. You can buy it at um, Sprouts, Whole Foods, Target. Um, they have an unsweetened one, so it's not going to have any sugar. But um, we were... And so you can try that one out. It was a little bit thicker. Uh, so we're, we're trying to stay away from too much soy for her or mm -hmm. almond milk. Um, and then also there's flax milk. We really like that. The brand is um, Good Karma. And you can get that at Target, Whole Foods, Sprouts. Those are the main stores I've seen it at, but you might be able to get it elsewhere. Um, and uh, they have different ones, unsweetened, if you want to have an added protein, uh, a non-meat uh, protein in there. They have vanilla, whatever you're looking for. Right, well, what I can add to that, you know, is that you've seen all these question. videos about the stress that cows are undergoing mm -hmm. when they're in these compacted areas. So think about cortisol and adrenaline and what's released. And if you're drinking that, you know, so that's going to affect you. So if a cow is being affected in a negative way continually, because it's more about stress. If it's ongoing stress, you're more likely to be affected. So if it's every day, all day, these cows are in bad shape, and then you're drinking what they're making. So. Um, I would say that I think it's pretty much been researched a lot that dairy causes a lot of inflammation in the body. Yes. Um, whether you're allergic to it or not, it's just an inflammatory food. Um, and, you know, animal milk is not, in my opinion, it's not meant for human consumption. Um, it's meant for, you know, like baby calves and, you know, the animals. Um, so I don't think it's something that we should be consuming. Um, but again, in moderation, it might work for some people. Um, but like Jenna was saying, the effect of the hormones on the body is um, not really a great thing that you want to be um, doing on a regular basis, and I don't think the effect has been fully studied yet. We're just beginning to see how milk and dairy products affect the body and like the negative, um, you know, outcomes of that. Can I just add one thing yeah. that I just wanted to add? There's a lot of foods that actually are pro-inflammatory. Just mm -hmm. to be off the back of that, just not just dairy, and so. Um, Foods that are pro-inflammatory. Pro-inflammatory that you just kind of want to. Mm -hmm. 
Like what? Soy is another one. Soy is another one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. My family history, osteoporosis, terrible. I have older hands that really walk off steps and their hips break because it's so brittle. Calcium, they're always pushing calcium, calcium. You know, in my family, it's literally in my heritage or generationally. And so, what is the source of calcium for getting rid of the milk? I, mm. <laughs> Because women need that for their bones, right, and men. So, yes, we definitely need calcium. I think there's a big miscon misconception that um, milk is the only source of calcium. Um, right, strawberries, broccoli, a lot of dark green leafy, ve leafy vegetables. Um, it's kind of funny because milk doesn't actually um, do our body good with calcium. It kind of leaches calcium from your bones. So it's the opposite effect. So I think we would be better off consuming um, plant-based sources of calcium in that, you know, in that case. And then also, sorry, just really quickly, um, weight-bearing exercises are actually um, really good to prevent osteoporosis, just to add on to the, the, what you're doing with your diet. All right. Thank you, ladies. Let's give them a round of applause. Woo!